Welcome to main lecture number 16 on ropes and pulleys. This is night 7.4 and he's got examples in 7.5. So the first thing is ropes or strings or cables. In general in this class when we have a rope or a string or a cable we neglect the weight of the rope, the string, or the cable relative to the weights of the things it's attached to. So if you have an engine block that might weigh hundreds of pounds and you have some kind of crane that you use to lift the engine block out of the car, you neglect the weight of, in this case, the chain that connects the crane to the engine block. And that's just because the forces that the uh, string or the cable or the chain can transmit are much larger than the forces it takes to move the string, the cable, or the chain itself. So let's look at just say a string connecting two blocks. And this string you can actually think of as composed out of a lot of little tiny things. You can think of a string in fact, at some deep level, a string is just like a whole pile of atoms all connected to each other in some way that somehow prevents them from falling apart. But you could think of a string as a whole bunch of little chunks. So here's a little chunk of string, and here's a little chunk of string, and here's a little chunk of string. Okay, so we have all these little chunks. And we can number these chunks, chunk 0, chunk 1, chunk 2, all the way up to, I don't know, chunk 2067, okay? And now let's look at one of these little chunks, like chunk number 113. Well, if this, we can neglect the weight of this string, then we can certainly neglect the weight of chunk number 113 of this string. So if I gave it a little name, like M113, and I said, well, this little thing here has some acceleration. It's, it's, got, it's attached to this block, and it's attached to that block. And whatever these two blocks are doing, this thing is doing too. So it has some acceleration that's going to be A113. If all these things are moving together, then there's only one A, which I might call A sub X. And A sub X times M113 is equal to whatever the force is on this end of this thing, okay, which would be the force of chunk 112 on chunk 113 and then there would be the force of chunk number 114 the force of chunk number 114 on chunk number 113 and so then we would have something like ax times m113 is equal to and i'll put this in absolute so i don't have to worry about the signs it's equal to the absolute f114 one one three minus F one one three one one two. But now here's where the masslessness comes in. If I can neglect the weight of this thing, and I can neglect the weight therefore of the individual chunk, then this left hand side is zero. I don't care how much that extra chunk one thirteen is accelerating, if I can neglect its mass, then the left hand side can be treated as zero. And so if that's zero, then F114 on 113 is the same as F113 on F112. In other words, this chunk didn't change the tension from this side of itself to that side of itself. And this is true for every chunk in the chain. So that means that whatever force the block is, is putting here on chunk number 2067, and whatever force that this block over here is putting on chunk number zero, because every one of those little chunks in between is perfectly transmitting that force onto the next one, we have just proven that whatever force this is putting on chunk zero is the same as whatever force this last chunk is putting on this block. In other words, the string transmits the tension perfectly, and you end up with a situation where even though this block here is A and this block here is B, even though we don't, they're not in direct contact, it is as if FAB is minus FBA, almost as if we've got another kind of version of Newton's third law, but it's because the thing is connecting to them is perfectly transmitting the force.
Okay. So that's really all I had to say about strings, ropes, cables, etc. Is you now know why we can mark them as having a tension and not really worry about that tension changing over the position of where you are in the string. Of course, if a cable weighs a lot, like let's say a cable does weigh a huge amount and it's hanging here, well, then actually, as a matter of fact, whatever's hanging off of this end, uh, whatever force mg here might be pulling down on this end, up here you actually are getting a larger force. You're getting the force mg downward plus whatever uh, mass this entire long cable has that reaches down to this lower thing. And uh, similarly, if there was acceleration, you might not be able to neglect the uh, ma that's associated with this long, heavy piece of cable. But in general, in the problems that we're gonna do, you're gonna get to neglect that. All right, so, police. Let's suppose you have a pulley. And let's suppose that off of one end of the pulley you have a basket, and off of another end of the pulley you have a basket. And let's suppose that you put into this basket a fish that you want to weigh. And if you want to weigh it, you can stick stuff into this basket, weights into this basket, until this fish basket is not accelerating upward and not accelerating downward until you can just kind of let it sit there and you've got exactly the amount of weight on the other side so that it doesn't want to move. So once you get things all perfectly balanced like that, then you just look at how much mass you put here and you say, that's how much my fish is. Like, okay, you know, I just sold you 575 grams of fish. Why? Because I put 575 grams over here and it balanced it. Now, why did that work? Well, it worked because the pulley here transmitted the tension perfectly. This would not work if this T1 and this T2 were not equal. So there's a deep and implicit assumption here, which is that pulleys transmit force very well. And it's actually not true if your push pulley isn't oiled very well. Um, but again, in this course, for the next foreseeable time, we're going to assume that the pulley itself all it does is change the direction of the tension. Or you can have a pulley where that's, the cable only goes uh, at some angle as it goes around the pulley. We're going to assume that these pulleys, all they do is change the direction of the tension force, which is uh, pulling back and forth in this string, to a, maybe some new direction, pulling back and forth in this part of the string, and does nothing else. Okay. So that's all I had to say about pulleys. Let's just do one example. One example. So over here I have a sailboat, or at least I have the mast and the boom of a sailboat, and then I have this big beautiful triangular sail here. And let's suppose that the wind's blowing hard enough that maybe I need to um, pull on this here with a strength of 1,000 newtons to prevent the boom from swinging out, okay? so. This tension, whatever, whatever this force is here, if you were just holding it and you were forced to hold the boom, let's suppose you needed a thousand newtons, okay? And the question is, is how much do you need if you have this nice pulley set up? Okay, so in other words, if I'm down here in, in the cockpit of the boat and I'm pulling on this line right here, and this line is, goes up to this pulley, down to that pulley, up to that pulley, back down to the base of the cockpit, and then is tied off, how much do I need to pull on this in order to generate that thousand newtons up here? Well, the beautiful thing is, is that this thing pulls down with a tension T, this thing is pulling down with a tension T, this thing is pulling down with a tension T, and that thing is pulling down with a tension T. So that means that the total, whatever the tension is in this thing, is actually pulling down four times on the, this boom. So 
if I need to generate a thousand newtons total, that means that I have four times T is equal to 1,000 newtons. In other words, T is equal to 250 newtons. In other words, I don't have to be a superhuman to pull on this with 250 newtons is a doable amount in order to generate a thousand newtons of pull here. So this is the kind of principle for all sort of what they call block and tackle um, setups. And it allows you to, thanks to what, a, it's a, a sort of a form of leverage, it allows you to do something with a modest amount of force here and generate a large amount of force there. Now, of course, you can't get something for nothing. When we get to chapter nine, uh, you'll see what you lose. All right, that's the end of chapter seven. And we'll work through some more examples on Friday. And then we'll be ready for chapter eight, where these problems are going to get uh, pleasantly trickier because we're going back and reintroducing two and uh, in some cases even three dimensions back into our problems.